Okay, I'll start recording then. So good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this week. Um, before I present the speaker today, we're going to be co-moderating with Tony Vo. Tony, maybe you could just introduce yourself. We are your fellow. Yeah, sure. So well, good morning, everyone, or I should say good evening from Australia here. So I'm Tony Vo. I'm a, I'm a um, first year interventional cardiology fellow at the um, Gold Coast University Hospital in Queensland in, in, in Australia, doing, doing coronaries, but a bit of structural as well. I, and I completed my um, general cardiology training last year. So this is my first year as an interventional fellow here. It's Excellent. Nice to Tony, thank you for joining us and thank you for no supporting worries. our CAT conference. We, uh, you always ask great questions. So we thought we'd give you uh, a stage to ask your questions in person so we can meet you. Okay. So it's my pleasure to, to have today a really good friend, uh, Mary Shishibu. I've known Mary for a number of years. We've collaborated in a number uh, of different areas and he's one of the people in the world that I respect the most uh, when it comes to peripheral intervention. And when I have a difficult question about peripheral, I always reach out to Mary. Mary, thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Azim, uh, for having me and uh, it's good to see you. And uh, saying, Tony, it's uh, nice meeting you and thanks. It's always fun to interact with our colleagues and our fellows, especially internationally. So this venue you have created, Azim, is very sweet. Uh, we get to learn and interact with folks from all over the world. And uh, I appreciate and I'm honored that you guys invited me to talk to you about this topic. Um, can I go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead, man. So let's have some fun then. Let's have some fun. So uh, as usual, I want to start with the case uh, because, you know, obviously the cases are the fun part. So this is 67 year old the male with a history of coronary artery disease. Uh, he had uh, previously had uh, stents in the past, uh, but he came in for some chest pain and shortness of breath uh, on his uh, some ST segment changes and a positive troponin. So it basically was a non-ST elevation MI. This was a case I dealt with uh, over 12 years ago. Um, and uh, it was referred to one of my partners uh, for uh, coronary evaluation. So it was transferred to us for PCI at the Cleveland Clinic at the time I was there. And uh, this was his medication. He was on clopidogrel, uh, 300 he was given and he was on heparin. So nothing big deal. Um, he uh, had history of HIV, uh, but his viral load and uh, were undetected and had normal CD4 count. Uh, his coronary disease was extensive, uh, as you can see here, multiple stents uh, in the prior years. And he also was known to have a triple A of about 4.8 centimeter. Uh, he is uh, proximal AFib, but not an anticoagulation. And I don't really know why he was not an anticoagulation, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, and he had uh, COPD on home oxygen. And then the routine stuff, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. So typical kind of a kind of a case that we do right non coronary disease multiple comorbidities you know home oxygen and the regular diabetes stuff these are his medications i don't think are going to be that relevant to the presentation so i'm going to skip them but a bunch of stuff and these are his labs his troponin was 0 0.10 uh, and his hemoglobin and hematocrit were 12 and 35 and a plate of 175 you know if i'm going to present you a case on a preflow talk there's going to be some bleeding so, so I want to show you the hemoglobin so you know what it is now before going to the procedure and a creatine of 1.1. So the patient came and my colleagues took the patient to the lab. And remember the topic here is that why every interventionalist needs to know some endovascular techniques. And that's why I'm presenting this case to you. So they went, they did some pictures. You can see that the LAD looks reasonable. There's a lesion in the mid to distal LAD. And uh, here is uh, another view of it. They don't have a very good selective injection, but overall it's not that bad. There is a distal lesion in the LAD. There is some disease in the diag. And then here are some other views. These are not that relevant. I'm just showing you for fun. Um, and here's a caudal view. And you see that the circ is kind of occluded or subtotal in the mid segment. And here's a picture of the right. And uh, let it play one more time. You see there's a lesion at the distal part of the stent. The patient had a previous stent placed in the right. And here's another view of it. Um, 
So they decided, the operators decided to fix the right. And I don't want to get into the logistics of it, what, whether the corporate was the circ or the right or whatever, you know, but uh, that's not the point of this presentation. But in any case, they decided to go after the right. You see, they had some challenges. So they went with the AR2, I think it was a guide, and they finally were able to extend this, post it, and this was their uh, final result. And they thought they had a good, reasonable result. So at this point, uh, they decided to exchange, because they had some difficult time, they had put a long six French sheet. So uh, they were not going to close the groin, they were gonna do manual. So they decided to exchange the six French long sheet for a short seven French, so that the sheet could be pulled in the prep and recovery area, like most of us do. Just one point of uh, 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 recommendation, there are half size sheets that are, uh, be, that are available. Uh, if you don't have it in your lab, you may want to consider it six and a half, so you don't need to go all the way to seven. Uh, so now we use half size sheets that are available. You can get them from Merit. And I don't have any financial conflict of interest with them at all. Uh, so the patient at this time was having some leg discomfort. So they put the J wire in the descending aorta according to what they said was that the wire was confirmed was in the descending aorta. They placed the they were trying to place the uh, seven French 35 centimeter sheet because the short sheet was having difficulty going in and they were worried because the patient was obese that maybe they were not reaching the artery. So they decided to put a long seven, a long, uh, seven French. After putting a 35 centimeter sheet, they saw there was no blood return and that the, the, the waveform was dampened. At this point, they decided to do manual compression but this was the time when we used to treat these patients with bivarudin. So the bivarudin was only turned off 10 minutes ago and uh, they decided, you know what, let's just do manual compression. And, I, and we can take a second here and, you know, and maybe it's hard to make it interactive. Usually this presentation works well if you are doing it interactively, but the bottom line is that some of the teaching points here is that if you don't ever rush uh, to make a decision, especially about access, you can do a beautiful intervention in the coronaries, but then screw it up or doing a taver, beautiful taver, and then things get out of hand when it comes to groin assessment. So if you have a sheet situation where you don't have flow, the last thing you want to do is uh, to pull everything out. You need to find a reason. And, uh, and I think here uh, there was a little bit of a rush uh, because there was no flow to move everything, especially when you are being uh, treating the patient with bivarudin. So in any case, they held pressure and the poor fellow that held this pressure for 90 minutes. And after approximately 80 minutes into the manual pressure, the patient was starting to complain of a right lower quadrant pain. Uh, but he was hemodynamically stable. Uh, so they completed the manual pressure and they said, you know what, let's get a CT to see what's going on. The second uh, honesty mistake, in my opinion, is that when you have patients that are on the table in the cath lab, or they are in the peri cat lab period. You did the patient, patient went to the prep and recovery area, and then all of a sudden it starts complaining. The last thing you wanna do is take him to the CAT scan uh, because there will not be any support. It will be very challenging. And these are the patients that typically end up coding in the CAT scanner. This is the patient that should come back to the cat lab. And hopefully we can discuss today as to what are the things that you would do to find out what's going on. So the patient uh, was being transferred at this point. Remember they had held for 90 minutes, uh, hemodynamically stable, complaining of pain. They wanted to send the patient to the CAT scanner to see what's going on. So they were transferring the patient from the CAT lab table now to the uh, hospital bed to be able to take him. And all of a sudden it became unresponsive. Uh, the crowded pulse was palpable. The CMET was called, code started running. And there was a 15 minutes of ACLS that were going on at this time, 15 minutes. He was transferred back to the cath lab table. Uh, and at this point, the op they were not sure what was happening. Uh, they thought maybe there was stent thrombosis, you know, uh, all kinds of things. And, you know, uh, we tend to uh, uh, go after things that we are comfortable. So if you're uncomfortable with growing complications, with endovascular uh, rescue procedures, we tend to go back to coronaries, you know, thinking that, oh, this is coronary, you know, because you're comfortable with it. So in any case, after shooting the coronaries and seeing that the coronaries were uh, actually at this time, they had gotten access on the other side and they had gone to shoot the coronaries. By this time, they called me 
uh, uh, coming down. And when I came down, this was the results of the lab that had come back since the time of the code had started. So hemoglobin, patient's hemoglobin was 5.6. Hematocrit was 18. This was his ABG. So I immediately asked for a five French IMA uh, uh, to, uh, and I also asked for a pigtail, but honestly it was too difficult to get an injection going. I mean, there was no time. We were already losing the battle. And that's another challenge with patients that have retroperitoneal bleed is that if you don't jump on it and the patient starts going to this spiral of acidosis, depressed heart function, and, uh, and obviously hypotension, is hard to get them out of it, especially when they have a lot of comorbidities, low EF, severe critical AS, and all the things that we treat. So I quickly got the IMA. I was worried, honestly, first about the AAA. I thought maybe something had happened to the AAA, and maybe the patient was bleeding from a AAA, or maybe even had a ruptured AAA. So I quickly took, oops, I took a picture here, and this better place. Yeah, it's playing. So I took a little picture here just to see if there was extravasation. And there was no extravasation. You can see the calcium of the AAA. So I was comfortable that the, there wasn't much going on with the AAA. And then I went to the next view. And when you do these pictures, you always want to do them on DSA because you really can see the extravasation. And I'm sorry, let me play this. And when we took this picture, we saw that this retroperitoneal bleed that you can see uh, happening. But importantly, also, you see that the patient is clamped down. The patient is on multiple pressures, acidotic. So we immediately did what most of you probably know how to do now, is that you need to uh, uh, tampon out this bleed. It's the same principles as you do uh, in the coronaries, except that you need to know how to go get up and over from the other side. What wire are you going to use? If that wire doesn't work, what, what is your next wire? What balloon are you going to use? What size balloon? So it's good to be familiar with a few devices that can help you in this dire situation, even if you don't know how to do any endovascular uh, procedures. Because even if you were to call your vascular surgical colleague or call someone like me, it's gonna take some time. So um, I immediately asked for a balloon, I tamponized the balloon and I asked for the covered stent. And uh, here it is, uh, we put a covered stent and I don't wanna waste too much time. Uh, and here's the other picture. But look at the forward flow. The patient's heart function has really depressed. And what I'm trying to make a point with this case is that how important it is. And I'm so honored that uh, Azim asked me to come and do this presentation because I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of the interventional training programs are heavy on a structural and coronary and not as a strong in endovascular skills. And a good number of fellows still are graduating not being comfortable to deal with complications like this. Thankfully, because of TAVR, I think their skill levels have gone up and more people can manage these things. But I still think that there are a lot of programs that rely heavily on other colleagues to come manage these. And I think you need to have some skills to deal with this. You don't want to be doing a coronary CTO and have a perf and have to call somebody else to come deal with it. Because by the time they arrive, the patient will not be alive. Unfortunately, in this case, this patient did not do well, ended up getting abdominal distension, uh, had a refractory acidosis, and the patient died. Uh, so, and this is not unusual. Uh, every year, probably in every hospital, there's one or two or three patients that die from growing complications and bleeding. And that's why many of us like the radial approach uh, because, uh, because of that risk gets minimized. But it's still, we do a lot of procedures that are from the groin with a large bore uh, assist devices like Impella, ECMO, and bloom pumps, and then also structural heart disease procedures, and even endovascular procedures. So I think that at the minimum, if you have no interest in endovascular skills and you are in a program that doesn't do any endovascular procedures, you need to be very familiar in how to take a DSA picture uh, of the aortoiliac system and how to learn how to do up and over technique at the minimum to be able to get to the other side quickly and uh, to be able to pass a wire and put a balloon to tampon out. Uh, I didn't put the wires and the balloons here. We're going to discuss them a little bit uh, because I, I think even if you don't know those, you can ask one of the nurses and the techs and somebody in the room is hopefully will know that, yeah, you need to use a, you know, a balloon, you know, 035 balloon. But typically if you cross with the 035 wire, 
a woolly wire or a stiff angle glide wire, you need an 035 balloon. And in the common femoral and iliac, if you use a six to seven uh, millimeter balloon uh, and about five to six centimeter in length, you'll be able to tampon out any perforation that you have. So very little things that you need to know to be able to really bail yourself out if you have a bleed until someone more knowledgeable can arrive. So what are the things that can go wrong and why endovascular skills can help you? So on the femoral side, obviously we have bleeding. That's the case I just showed you. We have dissections, we have high access and not knowing how to deal with high access can be an issue, especially if you don't have endovascular skills. <clears throat> you can have occlusions, which happen frequently now in the era of large bore devices such as TAVR and uh, Impella and those kind of things. Pseudoaneurysm and AV fistulas. And on the radial, similar things. You have bleeding occlusions. And hopefully I can quickly go over this. I think we finish at 8.30. So I try to finish by 8.15 so that uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, interaction. You guys can hear me OK, uh, Azim or Tony? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And so this is a case uh, talking about bleeding. What do you do when you have bleeding? This was a coronary case. Again, it's an old case uh, uh, that was being performed. And uh, the operators, after they did this uh, procedure, they went to close the groin. They were noticing patient was coming up some pain after they removed the sheet. Oops. And uh, this was the situation. Oops. Let's see. So uh, the first thing, you know, the question is, uh, what do you do in this situation? You know, the first thing you do, you use your hands. You jump on it like wildfire. You know, you don't, and you make sure that you're holding pressure where the access was. Look at this access. This is a high access point is probably above the inferior epigastric. And if you're just holding on a groin, and if the patient is big, you're going to actually increase the bleeding uh, because you're basically creating a tamponade uh, below the access point. So, the things to consider is the first thing is manual compression. So somebody needs to really strongly jump on, the, on it and control the bleed. The second is that you need to have an up and over approach. So somebody else should be getting access. And it's not that easy to get access because remember the patients are bleeding, they are having pain, they are moving. And if you don't have access on the other side, uh, it could become challenging getting access. So, so hopefully somebody talented, somebody that has done a few of these quickly gets access for you. And then you get an IMA and uh, you get a wire across in an up and over technique and get a six French or a seven French sheet, a 55 centimeter sheet. It could be anything. It could be a trumo sheet destination. It could be a high ansel um, from Cook. Uh, it could be a Raby sheet, any sheet, 55 centimeters. So familiarize yourself with the 55 centimeter sheets in your lab so you know what they are. Uh, that you can uh, ask for it when you are in practice or even now as a fellow. Then you balloon tampon out the situation so it can allow you to think and see what you're going to do. Do you have the skills to deal with this? Do you need to call a vascular surgeon or a colleague like me to come and help you? And do you have the tools that you need? I can tell you that when I came from Cleveland Clinic to UH, uh, the first time uh, I was started doing a complex aortoiliac case, I said, do you have a nine millimeter biobond? There was none on the shelf. So don't assume when you go to practice that you're gonna have these devices in your lab. Then you may not have it. And they may have it in vascular surgery. And since you're new, you may not even know where the OR is. So making sure that you have some of these tools, which I will show you is very valuable. And make sure you know the equipments and the tools as we discussed and choose the tools appropriately. And I will explain what happened. So, you, if you're doing any kind of a structural heart disease, any kind of you know, impella, large bore uh, uh, LV uh, support, anything like that, you better know this stent. Uh, otherwise, and, and Azim is probably laughing because I'm sure he has used this many times uh, during his structural procedures um, because this, this is inevitable. You're gonna have a perforation. You're gonna have it, you know, a vessel on the stick. You're gonna have something that's going to happen. And this device is going to save you. Um, and these are the sizes. Luckily, now we have the 018 system, and the 018 system goes in the smaller sheets. So it's not only important that you know you have it, it's also important that you know you have the, the sheet available and so that you can fit the stand inside of it. I can tell you that 
<clears throat> if you are in a lab that does uh, impellas and ECMOs and uh, structural heart disease, you should have a 12 French sheet um, uh, always available so you can uh, tampon out the aorta. So if you have a perforation, for example, in my lab, there's an area that we have a coda balloon uh, that goes to, through a 12 French sheet. So there's a coda balloon and a 12 French sheet that is labeled inside the lab because I do a lot of aortoiliac work. And uh, this is always there so that if you have a perforation of the aorta or iliacs, we can immediately get the device and be able to treat the patient. And I'm happy to share you the slides with you. So in this situation, we tampon out the, 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 the area, uh, we put the, uh, the viobon, and this is a very common mistake people make, <clears throat> is that they undersize the viobon because they are not familiar with endovascular iliac arteries. They come from the coronary ward, so they think everything is four or five millimeters. These arteries are nine and 10. So the common femoral is usually around eight to 10 millimeters. And what happens, they end up putting a six or seven because they have done a few endovascular procedures in the SFA. So they think that this is six, seven millimeters. And when they put the biobond, they are not able to get a good seal. And these are self-expanding stents and they're very difficult to grow. They have a self memory. So if you put a six, you cannot make it a nine. These are not balloon expandable stents. So they don't grow as well if you put, if you significantly undersize. So it's important to get a good sense of the sizing and tend to oversize a little bit in these arteries. If you are not sure, in my opinion, is even worth doing a QCA, measuring the artery or even ivising. Now, if the patient is bleeding, it's difficult to ivise. Um, but getting the right size is important because remember you wanna get a seal because you have a perf. And I can tell you in this case, I couldn't find the video last night. But in this case, we had undersized the viobon. And when we checked, there was still bleeding. So we ended up posting it enough to be able to get a good seal. And always, always, always make sure you take a DSA picture. This is not DSA because this lab, we didn't have DSA at the time we did this case. But make sure you do a DSA if your lab has DSA uh, to make sure that there's no extravasation and that you have completely sealed the artery before you leave. Now, bleeding can also happen in the arm. We're doing a lot of radial procedures. I don't have too many slides for this, but the key to this is having a cuff so that you can place it on where the bleed is. So identifying the bleed is one, quickly. And two, putting a cuff on where the bleed is. If the bleed is on the forearm, put a cuff pressure, increase the cuff pressure about 10 millimeters above the mercury of the systolic pressure for five minutes, and then reassess after five minutes. Same thing if it's in the upper arm, you can do the same thing, but you probably need a bigger cuff pressure to do that. It's easier to deal with bleeding in the obvious in the arm, but if you don't jump on it, you could get compartment, especially in the forearm. Not, not in the upper arm, but in the forearm, you can get compartment. So staying on top of it is helpful. High body dissection and high access. So a 69 year old, uh, very heavy patient, 320 pounds, obstructive sleep apnea and multiple comorbidities. He underwent a left heart cath with a very famous interventional cardiologist, I can tell you, not me. <laughs> and, and after the procedure, after they had done the diagnostic cath, they were gonna upsize to do the PCI and they saw this. And obviously these situations, a fellow always gets blamed as him, as you know. Uh, they, they blame the fellow, look, you did a high stick, you're by the inferior gastric, what were you doing? Were you trying to get access in the aorta? And you can see that there is also a dissection. So they asked me, they said, what should we do? Should we do the intervention? Should we stop? You know, I said, you know what, man, this is a high stick. And in those days we were using bivarudin for our coronaries. So I said, you know what, I don't think it's a good idea. So the point is, how do you deal with this? Do you just pull the sheet and hold pressure my own personal view is that, and you can see the patient's panis. My own personal, I do probably there's no randomized trial, right, to guide us in this situation. So it's all from experience and what's the safest thing to do, in my opinion. If things don't go right, how can you deal with the problem? My view of this is that because the patient is big and has a big panis, if you just pull and you are not able to deal with the problem, you will lose control. And once you lose control, it's a mess. So in this situation, even though uh, I don't like to get another access point, I think it's a good idea because it's such a high stake, it's a big patient. I wanna have control of the situation. 
That's why I don't like flying because I have no control. So if I don't have control, I'm nervous. So I decided to get, I told them, listen, let's get access on the other side and let's do this carefully. So how do you deal with this? So if you have a dissection, you obviously want to confirm that you're in the true lumen. Obviously there was a dissection there. So I will show you what happened. And um, remember most retrograde dissections are benign. So you don't need to do anything for them, but you just don't want to keep dissecting and you don't want to keep injecting and pushing the wire. If you're in a dissection flap, you just want to get out of that flap. So retrograde dissections from the groin up the aorta, nine out of 10, I would argue even 10 out of 10, they're benign, unless you keep dissecting and going up the aorta and you get the renals and the mesenterics involved. Do not inject hard and don't keep pushing the wire. Remember in interventional cardiology, we don't push. Everything has a reason. You only push when you know you need to push. When you're getting access, you should never ever have to push. The wire should easily go. If you have to push, you're doing something wrong. So you should look on the fluoroscopy, reposition your wire. Don't ever push, please. If you remember anything from this lecture, pushing is not the answer when you're trying to get access. And understand the mechanism of what went wrong. Why, why is there a dissection? You know, what, how did I get luminal if I was in a dissection flap and those kind of things? And IVUS can be helpful sometimes. Um, for high access, I suggest closure device for high access, especially if you have heavy patients like this, uh, may need contralateral access to secure, to give you some security if things don't go right. Let's say if you have a perclose failure. And perclose I like better because you can always have a wire down to, to control the situation. So in this situation, I got up and over access. You can see I have a six French sheet up here. I passed the wire down because I also was concerned that if you're in a false lumen, we may close the artery. So by putting a wire down and confirming that I'm in the true lumen, I knew I had true lumen access uh, from the top. Remember, our goal is not to send these patients to the OR if we can in a safe way. Now, if you have to go to the OR, you go to the OR. But if you can deal with it without having to go to the OR, that's the goal. So on the fluoroscopy, I did the per close. And after per close, I saw this. And it was a little bit unusual. I'm like, hmm, what's going on? Here I am on the left side where I'm showing you the mouse. I am luminal. Here is weird. Is this a blood clot? Am I in a false lumen? So because I am familiar with endovascular skills, I said, you know what? If it's clot, that's easy to deal with. Let me just angiojet it. So I put an angiojet and it didn't improve. At this point, I wasn't sure what was happening. So I decided to iris this. And I checked distally and there was no embolization distally. And look what happened. Here you can see that uh, we are in the, uh, part of it is in the true lumen and part of it is in the false lumen. So this is the, uh, the true lumen and this is the false lumen. And if you push the wire, you see that we went from the uh, uh, false lumen to the true lumen and this was the reentry area. You can see that this was the, where the, where the fellow got access, they were in the false lumen and then eventually they entered the true lumen. And that area that I was seeing was the false lumen. So in that situation, honestly, I decided to leave the patient alone. And that's something that I'd be interested to also take uh, Azim's point. My experience has been in dealing with complications of large board devices, and especially TAVR related complications is that you don't need to make it perfect. You don't need to make it perfect. You need to make sure that the patient is not gonna end up with an acute limb. You need to get flow going, and then you can deal with it later on. And in 80% of the cases, the patients actually do well. So you don't need to make it beautiful. Just make sure you have good flow, deal with the acute problem, and then downstream, you can deal with it accordingly. You don't want to send the patient uh, with acute limb into the OR who has critical AS that uh, you know, may not do well with anesthesia and those kind of things, or somebody on bivarudin that needs an operation. How about occlusion? This 88 year old female uh, with a creatine of 1.4, uh, coronary artery disease. This patient had critical AS. These were the old days of balloon valvuloplasty. And we brought this patient, you can see that the, the iliacs are not the smallest, but also they're not the largest. And in this situation, we decided to go from the left side. And here we are doing the valvuloplasty. And I know a lot of the fellows like to see these things. So I showed them the video. But after this, the patient started complaining of leg pain. And uh, this was the situation that a total occlusion after doing the pre-close uh, of the left common femoral artery. 
So they called me and they said, Mary, what do you think? So again, same techniques, up and over technique. We came, we crossed. In these situations after crossing, the first thing I like to do is to understand the distal anatomy because you know there's some thrombus there. And if you embolize, you wanna know what you embolize because you don't wanna take the problem from the common femoral and take it down to the tibials. So we took a quick runoff after we crossed and it's very safe to cross this with a stiff angle glide wire, which is the wire of choice in most of these. And then a five French uh, a catheter, either a GR4, a multi-purpose, you know, a navy cross, one of these catheters, a diagnostic catheter. And then you take nice pictures, you get a sense of your runoff. Then the question is that how do you deal with this? Majority of these occlusions, uh, even though they may be mechanical, meaning it's because of the perclose, they have some clot there. So you want to remove the clot before you do any ballooning or doing anything. And that's why it's a good idea to have some idea about this device, the angiojet device. And I left this in the slide set for you guys. So you are familiar. It's not really rocket science, to be honest with you. Actually, connecting it to the machine is probably the hardest part because if you don't use this in the lab, especially nowadays, because we don't do as much coronary angiojet, many of the people are not familiar. So if you can familiarize yourself, or if you have someone in the lab that does peripheral that use this device for DVTs, it's very easy to use. So we come with this device and uh, we typically do manual, uh, you know, angiojet manual thrombectomy. These patients obviously are not candidates for lysis because they have had multiple access points. You don't want to lyse these patients. Uh, but however, occasionally you may need to do it. Uh, I have never had to lyse a patient because of occlusion. This kind of occlusion, the clot is fresh and you should be able to suck it out. And uh, you need to understand the mechanism. What was the issue? Was there a dissection? Was it because the sheet was occlusive and there is clot, or was it the perclose that caused the problem? And obviously, you want to minimize the risk of distal embolization. So if you can put a filter, you can put a filter. It's easy to put, and you can put it. So in this situation, in the case I showed you, after doing multiple rounds of angiojet, this is what we saw. And I felt after doing an IVIS that there was a dissection flap. And it just I didn't feel good about this. I felt like this was going to close if I didn't treat it. So I decided to treat it with a Viobond. Honestly, now if I had to deal with this, I would have just put a self-expanding stent. This is not a perforation. So you don't need to put a Viobond. This is a, uh, and remember the lesion does not involve the bifurcation. So you don't even need to worry about jailing these vessels, the profunda. So you can put a nice stent here. And the nice, nice thing about self-expanding stents is that you can get access inside the self-expanding stents. And you can put sheets inside self-expanding stents up to seven French. So no concerns about putting a stent here at all, especially in the elderly. Now, if this was a 38-year-old female, maybe I would send them for surgery. But in 80-year-old, 85-year-old, actually now there is a couple of randomized trials showing that common femoral stenting is as good as endarthrectomy, if not better. So having some of that knowledge is also helpful because you may be biased thinking that, oh, we cannot put a stent in the common femoral. It's not true. And actually, the data is now a little bit in favor. We don't like to do it in young patients, uh, because obviously because of repeated trauma. So in this situation, and going back to what I was telling you earlier, and I wanted to show you, this was one of the earlier cases of my career. I was trying to be conservative, and I put a six biobond, and you can see that the artery is about eight millimeters. So you can really undersize these arteries. Remember the common femoral is a huge artery, is eight to nine millimeters. So that's another teaching point. I can see the date here, this is from 2010. Uh, so about 10 years ago. Um, uh, and you wanna make sure that you're sizing these appropriately. So in this situation, I end up ballooning, ballooning it multiple times and getting a reasonable result at the end. So sizing is important in the common femoral and the iliacs, especially if you have a perp. This was just a dissection. And again, if you have a dissection or a clot, you don't necessarily need to put a covered stent. You can just put a self-expanding stent, usually a, a seven or an eight millimeter self-expanding stent in the common femoral. And this is after we posted it, and this is the angiogram. Um, for occlusion, occasionally surgery may be better, but this is, again, I've changed my mind over the years. Because like I said earlier, you don't need to make it perfect. You need to, to do a little bit of thrombectomy, a little bit of ballooning, and make sure that you don't destroy the profunda uh, and you'll be fine. 
It will take care of the situation uh, so that you can get the patient out of the cat lab. And then as an outpatient, deal with it if the patient has uh, claudication symptoms. And it is okay to extend the common femoral, as I've said here. How about uh, occlusion in the arm? Uh, this is one condition that I would highly recommend that you do not treat uh, percutaneously. Brachial artery occlusion. This is a very easy surgical intervention. The surgeon does, does a cut down on the brachial artery, which is very superficial, and they can remove this in a, a 15-minute procedure. So I never go after this. Can you do it? Yes, you can do anything. But if you embolize to the hand, then you really get into big trouble. And it's very hard to justify it, to be honest with you, because it's such an easy operation and it's so superficial. So for brachial artery occlusion, I send these patients to the OR and I do not mess with it with doing angiojet or ballooning or those kind of things. I've seen case presentations, especially interventional cardiologists trying to go after this. I think it's a mistake. Like I said, you can get away with it, but you can get into trouble. How about pseudoaneurysms? Uh, this is a common complication that we deal with. I inject these myself, so I don't need to call a surgeon or somebody to deal with it. I think it's good if you have someone in your group that knows how to deal with this and do these because these are easy to deal with. And if your colleagues in surgery are not familiar, they may take these patients to the OR to fix them. And I don't think they're necessary. Uh, they're really, you don't need to treat pseudoaneurysm these days with surgery, very, very rarely. I have never sent, I send a patient one time to surgery and the patient ended up getting groin infection and had bad complications. So I rarely, if ever, send this patient to surgery. These are, we can inject with thrombin and ultrasound guidance, and it's easy to do. Not something I can teach you right now here on this presentation, but I think if you can find a colleague that knows how to inject these, that's the way to go. Uh, if they are small, less than two centimeters, you can try to occlude them with ultrasound for about 15, 20 minutes and reverse the anticoagulation but most of these need to be injected with thrombin. How about pseudoaneurysm, the radial? Uh, this now I have seen a couple of times. This is a friend of mine actually who sent me a case. And then after he sent me this case, I had one on my own. Uh, and these, the way you treat this is with a TR band. You send the patient home with a TR band um, and you basically inflate the TR band not uh, to a non-occlusive uh, pressure. Um, and you tell the patient to have it on for 24 hours, the next day, the pseudothrombosis. Again, the key is that it's non-occlusive, enough pressure to compress the pseudo. And this is a case of a friend of mine who sent it to me. And uh, I've had one of my own cases that I did the same thing. I gave them TR band, I send them home. Non-occlusive, please remember, it should be non-occlusive. And uh, the patient did well, and the pseudo was gone the next day. Well, uh, I hope I gave you a little tour of uh, some of the endovascular skills to deal with some of the complications of uh, coronary and structural heart procedures, and we can open it up to some discussion. Thank you so much. Maddie, thank you so much. That was excellent. That's exactly what I wanted. You know, um, We didn't want to go into, into high-tech peripheral. We wanted the fellows to get a sense of what it is they need to learn during the year um, during their fellowship year. So, and I, and I think I agree with you. I think every interventional cardiologist needs to know how to do an up and over uh, and put a balloon to tampen our bleeding. Because then once you have it under control, you can, you know, you can call other people, you can uh, do whatever needs to be done. I also have, so we'll have Tony in a second, um, give you some questions and the questions from the chat. Uh, we also have uh, Jose Wiley, who Jose is a good friend and our endovascular guy at Monty. And so he's usually the person I call when I call when I have big trouble or when I need to inject a pseudo aneurysm. He's got a lot of experience. Uh, so Jose, you can unmute yourself if you have any comments. Uh, that will be great. I did have one question for you, uh, Maddie, before I pass on to Tony. Um, stenting the common femoral artery. Now that's been, you know, controversial for many years, right? I remember in the past, um, actually, Jose is now is here with me. Uh, that's Jose, by the way, Mary. Hi, Jose. How are you? How are you? Um, it's been pretty controversial in the past, stent in the common femoral. I remember when I started my practice, I got, you know, a vascular surgeon very angry with me 
uh, because I stand to the common femoral. <laughs> so I'm, you know, a little bit maybe your insight into um, where you said there's data briefly, you could mention what the data is. And number question number one, question number two is what stent do you use when you when you stent in the common femoral? Do you use a, a specific stent, self expandable, balloon expandable? And then number three, do you put a long stent or a very short stent, as you know, as short as you need to treat the lesion, or do you go for longer stent? Great, uh, thanks, uh, Azim. I think that the first uh, thing to recognize is that is what is the the patient that you're dealing with. As I said earlier, if you, majority of these patients have a lot of comorbidities, right? Who are we putting in Paline? Who are we putting ECMO in? Who are we doing TIRES? Now, TIRES have changed over time. Now we're doing lower risk, obviously. But majority of the patients that we are treating are with a lot of comorbidities. And there is a reason they are getting these large board devices. So most of them are not the best candidates for surgery. That's number one, in my opinion. Number two is that we have learned now that these self-expanding stents that we put in the common femoral or anywhere, we can access them. Honestly, when I was training, we never did that. And uh, kudos to Andre, uh, to, uh, to Andre Schmidt that taught us this, uh, that you know, we can actually access this. And now I routinely put sheets and balloons and wires inside the stents and do procedures. So there is no concern. Now, you cannot put a 12 French sheet inside, I agree but it can definitely access these arteries with six, seven French sheets if you need to. That's number two. Number three is that I have learned over time that most of these, you don't need to make it perfect. So you don't even need a stent. If you are do, able to do a little bit of thrombectomy, a little bit of ballooning, you get reasonable flow. Even if you have 50% residual, you're fine. You let it go. And then you can deal with this as an outpatient. Now in an outpatient setting, we have multiple options. We can do arthrectomy, we can do DCB, all kinds of things are available to us that we may not be able to do in an acute setting because of, you know, there is you know, dissection, there is, there is clot, you cannot do DCB or atherectomy in those settings. Mm -hmm. So, so for, and then there is data now that supports us. So there are a number of um, uh, retrospective studies. The biggest series came from Thomas Zeller who showed the uh, uh, safety of putting a stent in a common femoral, but we now have two or three randomized trials comparing stenting versus endarthrectomy, not for these kind of complications, for common femoral atherosclerotic disease that have shown equivalent, and in some cases, even less infection with the stent. As you know, the, one of the major issues with the common femoral endarthrectomy is groin infection, which can be a big problem, especially in obese patients. So overall, I think that the field has changed. It's similar to the popliteal. You know, we used to say, don't stand the popliteal is a bend area, but now we have all these beautiful stents like Supera that we can use that made our life easy. We don't even, I never send a patient now for popliteal occlusion to surgery. Honestly, I don't remember doing that in the last 10 years, eight years. So, and lastly, to answer your question about the type of the stent, I think if you have a perf, you put a viobon, right? If you have a perf, you have to put a viobon, you have to put a cover stent. Yeah. If you don't have a perf, I think it's more beneficial to put a self-expanding stent because you don't jail the profunda, obviously, and you want to preserve the profunda as much as you can, as much as you can. Number two, it's always good not to put too much stent. So put enough that you need. It's not a good idea to, to extend the stent beyond the inguinal ligament. If you have to do it, you do it. But if you don't have to do it, it's not a good idea to, ex to extend the stent from the common femoral or SFA into the iliac because of the inguinal ligament that can cause fracture or break the stent. In regards to the type of the stent, we used to think supera is the best stent to put in the bend area because as you may know, the supera is the interwoven stent, is different, is not like a nitronal stent, which is one wire cut into a stent. Supera is six wires uh, interwoven together and doesn't fracture basically. It's never been reported to fracture, but in my opinion, is not the best stent for the common femoral because as I said earlier, common femoral is usually eight to nine millimeters. And supera, the biggest supera that we have in the US is six and a half. So it's usually tend to be undersized. And I don't think it's necessary, honestly. So in my opinion, I don't, now if you have severe atherosclerosis, it may work. But if you have situations where the common femoral was not that diseased, and now you're putting a stent because you had a dissection or you had a 
little perf or a clot or a, or a suture, this is not going to be a good idea to put an undersized stent in that setting because it's going to be floating. There's no plaque to get a good apposition. So uh, for that reason, I tend to put just self-expanding stent, any nitrogen self-expanding stent, just make sure that you're sizing it appropriately, eight, seven, eight, nine even in the common femoral. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Um, Tony, all yours. So, yeah, Norris. So thanks, thanks for the excellent talk um, on Mary and um, thanks for the tips and tricks and I'm very practical. Um, so I think, I think in cases like this, I think it's very important that, you know, you try to prevent these complications in the, in the first place. So especially with, with all my femoral um, sticks, I'll always try to go use an ultrasound to just make sure, you know, we're not too high or too low or even screen the femoral head if we don't have ultrasound. So I think it's very important just to prevent this, but you know, doing high risk procedures inevitably, we will we'll probably come into, um, into this you know, one day sooner or later. Um, just very quickly, um, some questions from me first. So just say for, for example, if you, for, for, for one reason or the other that your lab don't, doesn't have the, the correct equipment and you want to improvise, Using how about using coronary wires and using coronary balloons to tamponade? I think you, you, you kind of already mentioned that you know the, the common trim artery is eight to nine millimeters, but trying to use your biggest um balloon that you have on the shelf would, would that work? Yeah, the, the obviously if you are caught in a fire, you do whatever you can, right? You know, if you are caught in a fire, you got to take care of yourself and uh, you got to do uh, you know whatever it takes. The, the challenge is that I think if you have a perf in the common femoral, you, you, you may be able to tamponade it. But the one thing I would say is that uh, knowing that most likely you don't have a full tamponade. Like if you're putting it, what's the biggest coronary balloon? We have five. I, I, I think five is the biggest. Let's say six. Um, I think there's six non-compliant six available. I don't think they have, uh, comp uh, you know, I, we have compliant six, but I don't think they have non-compliant six. I don't know. Azim probably knows. But the... But I think the biggest one we have is five or six. If you are in the external iliac and it's 10 millimeter, you know, artery, there is no way that's going to tamponade it. Now, can you put mm. two balloons? Yes. Can you do creative things and put two balloons next to each other and do two, you know, things? Obviously, you can. And can you wire these arteries with an 014 or a 018 wire? 100 percent So yes, I would not just stand and not do anything. I think manual pressure is a good option, even if it's external iliac perforation. Putting it, making sure that you're on top of it. That's that's one idea. If you if you have a coda balloon, occluding the aorta. So if you're working doing tavers and you're doing aortic valvuloplasty, you have those balloons. You don't have balloons in the you know peripheral balloons, but you have you know big balloons. You can put those. Actually, you can even put those in the iliacs. You just don't go as high. So you can put those balloons. And so that's another option. And I would go to that probably next. So if I had no peripheral balloons, I would go to those balloons next. Use one of the valvuloplasty balloons. If you didn't have those, then I guess I guess you can use you know uh, you know uh, coronary balloons if you had. To. Mm, yeah, mm. I think that's a good point, Mary. And I want to reiterate for the fellows. And I think wherever you go to when you're going to start your new jobs, make sure you're familiar with the equipment they have, and make sure you know where the emergency stuff are. Right. Um, you don't need to have a lot of peripheral balloons. Uh, even if you're not a peripheral center, you just need a balloon for cross for, for to going over uh, over and for crossover and for balloon tamponade. You're probably okay with an eight millimeter balloon, right? I mean, that's the one I tell most of my fellows to know and to have close by because it's the largest balloon you could put inside a six French sheath, which is the most common sheath we use, and you'll basically occlude any common femoral uh, with an eight uh, eight millimeter balloon. Um, the other one that I also make sure, because I do a lot of large bore access for Tarver and um, um, for Impella, uh, is what uh, Mary mentioned, is to know that you have an aortic occlusion balloon. Um, there are many different ones. Uh, Coda is the one of the ones most commonly used. Mary, I use, uh, just so you know, I use a balloon from ZMAD. It's their sizing balloon. They have a sizing balloon, okay? That there's 25, 30, 35, very compliant. The reason I like it is because it's eight French compatible. Wonderful. So I've, you know, in a bad perforation, I've gotten brachial access and put it from above uh, and occluded from above so that I can still work from below and put in stents and so on. Uh, so that's just a good one to know you, uh, to know about. Yes. yes. Tony, go ahead. 
Yeah, so one of the questions from Judah. I think that, was, just to reemphasize this, Tony, by the way, just to reemphasize, yeah. it is not a good idea to be doing procedures if you don't have the equipment to bail you out. So if mm -hmm. your hospital doesn't have it, I think it's not a bad idea to say, listen, I can't you know, do these procedures then. So please mm -hmm. be careful. You know, you, know, you don't want to you know, be cut off guard. You know, if you're going to do complex procedures, you have to have the equipment to bail you out. You don't need to have every single balloon, but you need to have a few things. And I'm happy to make a list if it's going to help the fellows um, and, you know, and, and have it available. I think we can send it to them if you want. Yeah, so, Mary, remember we, we invited you to write uh, a short oh, right. uh, article for us for, um, you know, I'm the editor for, cardio, for Cardiac Interventions. Um, and so in the October issue, and I'm doing some self-advertising, Tony, excuse me. Um, in the October issue, we have a whole issue for you, for the fellows, and we're calling it Learn the Techniques. And one of the techniques we thought was very important to learn was how to do a crossover up and over and just know the basic equipment you need. So Maddie agreed to write that. So hopefully we'll, you know, you'll have, all of you who are listening will have that in the next few months, uh, which will be really useful. So I've got a question from Judah here, and he or he or she asks: So when before performing balloon tamponade via up and over for uncontrolled access site bleeding, what do you do with anticoagulation, and does it differ if anticoagulation is with bivalirudin or heparin? Yeah, it makes a huge difference because you know, with uh, obviously with heparin, uh, you can quickly uh, reverse it with protamine, and we are very cavalier with using protamine. I mean, for most procedures. Uh, even for left main stenting, honestly, for anything, you know, uh, we, we are comfortable giving protamine and have actually a lot of experience uh, with that. You know, a couple of my colleagues, when, when I came from the clinic, I saw these guys, you know, giving 60, 50 of protamine and I would get nervous after doing unprotected left main and all that. I'll be like, you guys are crazy. Why are you giving, are you giving protamine? And they never had a complication. I'm interested to see what is uh, Jose and Azim's experience. But, and for peripherals, 99% of the time I give protamine. So heparin, obviously, very easy to reverse. Bival is a different ballgame uh, because, uh, you know, uh, we cannot reverse it. Uh, Half-life is about two hours. Uh, so um, that's the challenge, and that was the challenge with that case that I showed you guys. So, uh, but we don't use as much bival. As a matter of fact, I don't remember the last time I used bival in the last few years since uh, the beautiful study that was published. So, yeah. um, Azim, I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? So, yeah, I completely agree with you. I'm going to let... I'm going to put uh, Jose on the spot because he still use, uses Bival. And he does. I don't use Bival anymore. I haven't for years um, because of the issues, you know, with bleeding and when we've had big coronary perforations and so on, but also because of the clinical data that shows there's absolutely no benefit. But um, Jose, you use Bival. What do you do? What do you, what's your yeah, advice? So I use Bival really just because of the comfort. I don't have to be checking ACTs every uh, 15, 20 minute, minutes. Obviously, I use it in areas that are compressible. I will not use it when I'm doing iliacs or I'm doing subclavians because of the risk of, uh, of uh, bleeding and not being able to control it. Uh, in the case uh, where I have a perforation, I mean, I, I, I can't do anything else other than balloon tamponade, as we have been speaking. Um, however, when we use... Uh, Can you a little closer? Yeah. When uh, we use uh, heparin before, as uh, I was like you, I felt a little uncomfortable using uh, protamine because of the, the risk of, uh, of an anaphylactic shock. But after I've, I've been working with Azim, you know, that fear has uh, lessened significantly because uh, in structural care cases, you use it very routinely. Uh, but uh, most of the times, uh, I, I've, I now feel very comfortable re reversing. So have any issues with that yeah so you know i i you know add to that you know in the old days maddie you know with the siphon texas days we actually published a case series in cci of acute stent thrombosis happening when we gave protamine for perforations okay and then we stopped for a while and i have to say and uh, now in the you know second third fourth generation stent days i don't think that concern is a concern anymore um, I think, you know, there are many people using protamine, you know, in Spain, their centers use it routinely after PCI, they've not shown increased risk of stent thrombosis. Uh, Sanjo Kalra, who also in the chat made a comment that there's data from the University of Washington, and their CTO PCI, showing that 
there's a clear drop in death and tamponade that mirrors the increase in protamine use with bleeding with no increase in stent thrombosis. So I think that's pretty safe. Um, but maybe Tony, Judah actually had a different question in, in relation to this that maybe you want to mention. Yeah, he goes, the question was more related to prevention of clot formation during balloon tamponade. Yeah, we don't see it, you know, uh, so in the, obviously when you have a coronary perf, it's a different ball game. But, uh, you know, I don't reverse when I have a coronary perf. I don't know, Azim is an expert, so he can tell us. But in the periphery, in the periphery, it depends. Uh, so um, if you have a, if I have a perf in the leg below the inguinal ligament, I don't reverse because I can deal with it and it's not a major issue. But when you have a perf, like the ones that we are showing, 12 French perf, on by Rudin, I think in those situations, definitely reversing is a good idea. And ballooning does not cause clotting. As a matter of fact, when we're doing a lot of these procedures, aortoiliac procedures, many operators don't even give heparin. I give heparin, but there are many operators that work on aortoiliac, you know, atherosclerosis and don't even give heparin. They just do it without any, any heparin. I don't like doing that. I give heparin. I don't keep the ACT too high. So I have not seen uh, clotting uh, from balloon tamponade of four, five, ten, even fifteen, even minutes. Um, uh, Azim, you have probably done long uh, inflations. Uh, you yeah. know, have you ever seen? Absolutely, I completely agree. You know, we we give the protamine in tavas even before we pull the big sheath out, uh, and we we you know we give a lot of protamine, anywhere between fifty and hundred milligrams of protamine uh, to completely reverse. Uh, I've not seen thrombus at the um, at the side of the sheath, um, and, and and often if there's bleeding, we'll balloon tamponade. We'll stay up for five minutes at a time. We will put a timer on and we'll stay up for four to five minutes, then deflate the balloon, get some flow going again, and then we inflate. In the older days, we would stay up for 10, 15 minutes, okay, after protamine, and that's the problem. Then you will get thrombus. You need to stop after four or five minutes, get flow going again. You also see there's bleeding. Uh, and then reinflate. You know, Mary, one of the one of the biggest issues we had is so in the early days we used to see a lot more thrombosis, okay, at the access site, and we thought it was the balloon tamponade, but it wasn't. It's actually the fact that before you put your big sheath in, you have to make sure you've given heparin, and that you've given therapeutic doses of heparin, and it's that time to circulate, right? So, Tony, what the problem is that many people will put their big sheath in without the patient being fully heparinized, and even if the artery is eight millimeters, nine millimeters, and you put a 12 French sheath in, okay, which is much smaller. You, you're amazed how often these sheaths, they cause a little bit of spasm, the artery actually, you can be occlusive with a 12 French sheath in a decent sized artery. So to me, the biggest risk of thrombosis at the excess side is putting a large sheath in without the patient being adequately heparinized rather than the balloon tamponade afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and I totally agree. And a lot of times when we saw occlusion was honestly a, com a combination of the perclose and clot that had formed around the sheet, uh, yeah. you know, uh, that was caught in that. And a lot of that had to do with the anticoagulation. So I think aggressive anticoagulation. And again, as, as, as Im said, you know, I have not personally seen a clotting from balloon tamponade and reversal with protamine. Yeah, I, I'm sure if you leave the balloon up for 30 minutes, you probably may get clotting. It's not a good idea. I think that, and plus you, are, you, you want to treat the patient, right? So you balloon for five minutes, you have time to think, you call the right people, you made a decision, you, you let the balloon down. If you're still bleeding, you're most likely not going to go away. So you're going to have to make a decision as to what to do next. So either you're going to stent it or you're going to, you know, do whatever that is necessary to, to deal with the complication. We had issues in the past when we did a very prolonged balloon inflation, as, as you mentioned before, and Azim, this 20 minute balloon inflations at times cause up thrombosis, but we significantly went down on that time. We do five, 10 minutes, deflate the, the balloon, take a picture again, and then reinflate again for five to 10 min minutes. But you know, if you go too aggressive up to 15, 20 minutes, that's when you increase the risk of uh, inside of thrombosis. Tony, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Mary, do you mind another two or three questions before oh, we start? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So one from Zayed. So the, the coronary procedure is done and you've deployed the, either the perclose or the angiosteel and now you check the femoral pulse and it's now absent. What would you do next? Can you just balloon and break the suture? 
Yeah, very good question. You know, so this is the case that you should never take the patient off the table because you're going to take the patient off the table and then you're going to be doing other cases. Things get delayed. Patients starts having pain, starts clotting more on top of the occlusion. And, uh, and then you're going to get into trouble, you know, uh, and by the time you bring the patient back, you know, there's clots and all kinds of things. I think that if you, if you don't feel a pulse and the patient complaining of pain, um, you need to immediately at that point deal with the issue. You're in the lab, just deal with it. So in this situation, I would get contralateral access and I would start with undersized balloon. Remember, the enemy of good is perfect. And as I have said multiple times in this presentation, you don't need to make things perfect. You want to get the patient stabilized so you can get out of the lab. In those situations, I will cross the, the occlusion. In these situations where it's a suture-related, perclose-related uh, occlusion, usually it's maybe better to cross with an 014 or an 018 wire, to be honest with you, a jacketed wire, like a Pilot 200 or something like that. Or if you're going to use a, a 018, a Glide Gold, something hydrophilic, uh, so you can cross you confirm that you are luminal distally, especially if you don't have a lot of experience with peripheral, it's always good to make sure that you are you cross luminally, you're not on a sub space. Confirm that you're luminal and then go with a four millimeter balloon. Do a four millimeter balloon and see what it looks like. Now, what's the worst thing that can happen? The suture breaks and the patient starts bleeding. You have to have the skills to deal with it. So then you tampon out it with a balloon and you deal with it accordingly. You reverse, you hold pressure. If that doesn't deal with it, you have to cover, put a cover stent. I don't think it's a good idea to be too aggressive in these occlusions, suture associated occlusions. You just want to get some flow so you don't get clotting and acute limb. After that, you know, you can deal with it accordingly as an outpatient. So I typically undersize the balloon in these acute suture associated occlusions with a four or five angioplasty balloon and then usually patients do very well, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, you know, in small patients with TAVA and two proglides, we've often seen these stenoses and occlusions uh, from the sutures. And everybody's like super worried about, will you break the sutures because you've pulled a short one? I've never seen it happen. The number of times we've ballooned inside proglides, I mean, I can't tell you hundreds of times, and I've not seen a suture break. And like I say, you just want to get flow. I mean, it's amazing how in these LD patients, if you just get flow, even if you re re leave some residual stenosis, even 50%, 60% residual stenosis from the sutures and you, and you do a Doppler a month later, it looks fine. Uh, it actually, you know, the, the tissue kind of stretches and, uh, and uh, accommodates. Sorry, Maddie, you were saying. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say that. And also, they are not the most active people. So they're not going to be running marathons and, you know, doing a lot, you know. So for their ADL, is enough, you know, they, they usually don't get claudication. And if they do, you can deal with it as an outpatient. And by that time there is healing, we can be much more aggressive and there's other op uh, options available to us. Again, this is not atherosclerotic disease. This is an injury that was created and most of the times it heals on its own. So it's, it's, it's really not a big deal. Uh, when you have a, uh, a closure from uh, angioseal, it's, uh, it's perhaps a little trickier because you still have the foot plate. And in that case, uh, you could always, after you cross your your, uh, your your occlusion, you could put a filter down. Now the question is where you put the filter. You put the filter in the profundo, you put the filter in the SFA. Remember I learned a few year, years ago from Bill Gray, and it makes a lot of sense. You put the filter in the SFA, not in the profundo. The profundo has so many branches that it's not gonna be a big deal. What you wanna do is uh, put your filter in your SFA, open it up, if something goes down, you will be able to trap it in your filter and take it out. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. So I have a question from Manav. So he says, you mentioned that retrograde dissections of the femoral RT will almost always self-resolve. If you do suspect dissection at the access site, how do you confirm the type of dissection uh, retrograde versus antegrade? And if you confirm retrograde dissection, what if any follow-up testing do you do after the case? Yeah, it's a good question. So it won't be anti-grade because remember, anti-grade dissections happen spontaneously because you are going retrograde. Just by the nature of your direction, you're going uh, retrograde. So these are called retrograde by definition because we're getting retrograde access. And you don't need, in my opinion, you don't need to do any kind of checking in these patients because these heal on their own. 
The only time I would say that you may need to do a CAT scan or something if you extend the dissection all the way to the thoracic aorta. So you like, you know, and I've seen it, believe it or not. And even in those cases, honestly, they, he healed on his own. Uh, so um, if you just uh, uh, isolated to the iliacs, nothing needs to be done. Just remove your stuff, remove your sheet, remove your equipment, and it will heal. Uh, if he extends all the way to the abdominal and goes up the, uh, uh, you know, thoracoabdominal aorta, you may want to do a CAT scan uh, to just make sure things have healed. Now, if the patient is in pain, if the patient, you know, you, you cause a dissection, you realize you're in dissection flap, you remove this stuff, patients complain of severe back pain. That's a different ballgame. And if the patient is complaining of severe back pain, that needs to be addressed. I think that needs to, I would get a baseline CT in those patients. Most of these patients don't have pain. And as a matter of fact, you find it incidentally, meaning that the wire is not going. And then finally you take an injection and you're like, oh, you know, what happened? But if the patient has pain, that's not a good indicator. And I think in those patients, a good idea, even though things may go safely to get a baseline CAT scan, so you have it. Yeah, absolutely. We probably cause a lot more of those than we know. Um, and most of them just result spontaneously. Um, maybe to both you, Mary and uh, Jose, there was, a, there was a question from Dr. Menegas. What about if the pseudo has a large neck? Uh, can you still inject it or do you do something else? Yeah, I can, if you want, Jose, you want to take it or do you want me to answer that? I can, you know. No, that's okay. And I'll give some comments afterwards as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the, I, I'll be honest with you. Every the, uh, Like I said, the one time that I sent the patient because of a large neck uh, to surgery, I got burned. I have a bad experience. I'm never biased on this one. I think is it may has to be a huge neck for me, I guess, to send them to surgery. I think majority of these you can inject. You just have to inject very slowly uh, and make sure that the needle is not deep. Now, you can also balloon tamponade. So what you can do, you can come with a balloon, put it inside the artery uh, at the neck, and then and you don't need to inject that much, very little. We're talking about maybe one or two uh, cc. Um, you know, so a little bit of, just make sure you're not too deep, put the balloon, put the needle, make sure you're not too deep, inject, and then I would leave the balloon up for about five minutes, three to five minutes, and then you should be fine. I have knock on wood, I have never had a complication from thrombin injection, and we used to do a lot of it, especially where I came from at Cleveland Clinic, because we just did a lot of procedures. We had a lot of it, and we did it in vascular medicine. We injected all the pseudos, and I was one of the people that did it. Uh, I, we injected pseudos in the subclavian, in the iliacs, in the carotid, and, um, and uh, some of them are the huge necks. So I am not, I think this neck thing is a little bit overrated. Um, as long as you're able to protect it with a balloon, if you're very concerned, you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I like that idea. That's very elegant. Inflate a balloon that way, you know, there's no risk, right? Uh, that's very elegant. So I don't remember the last time uh, that I, I had to inflate a balloon uh, to do a, uh, a thrombin injection on a pseudoaneurysm. I re recommend everyone to uh, look up an article by uh, uh, Jeffrey Olin, uh, who uh, uh, wrote actually, I think, were two articles on a, a pseudoaneurysm uh, thrombin injection, and it goes step by step on how to do this uh, procedure. One of the, the things that is very helpful is when you get your needle in the pseudoaneurysm sac is to deflect the needle away from the neck. And uh, as uh, Mary has said, you just inject in 0 0.1, 0 0.2 cc's, that's it. Don't try to inject the whole uh, knee, uh, uh, syringe. It's very, very little thrombin that is a bovine thrombin that is needed to cause a thrombosis of the pseudoaneurysm. Excellent. I think we're going to stop there. We've kept you 10 minutes longer than we wanted to. There was one more question from Zane Bat about materials. Zane, uh, Dr. Shishibu is going to write a really nice two-page article with just basically everything you know in, the, in, in cardiac interventions today, later in a few months, so you'll get that. Um, Tony, thank you so much for moderating with us. It's great to know we have a, you know, friends and fellows from Australia who are joining us. Um, Mary, um, Jose, thank you. Uh, Mary, I can't thank you enough, man. That was great. It was fantastic. We all learned something. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and this was thank you. awesome for the fellows. I really appreciate you taking the time.
Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a safe day. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.